Kimberly Grasset, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the phylum Chetonatha. Chetonaths are also known as the bristle jaws or the arrowhead worms. There's approximately 130 species in this phylum, which are spread out between two orders and nine families. The first record of a Chetonath was recorded by Martinus Slaver in 1775, and the first known Chetonath to be kept in captivity was noted by Charles Darwin. So what is a Chetonath? A Chetonath is a planktonic animal that displays bilateral symmetry. It has a complete digestive tract. It's a protosome, a coelomate, and it lacks a circulatory, respiratory, and excretory system. So where do these fall in the phylogenetic tree? This is very much contested right now in the science world, and a lot of it surrounds the idea of the blastopore development. So in protostomes, the blastopore forms the mouth, whereas in deuterostomes, the blastopore forms the anus. In ketonaths, the blastopore doesn't develop into anything, which makes it hard to distinguish between whether it's a deuterostome and a protostome. In addition to the blastopore not being much help, um, the ketonaths see a secondary development of the mouth, so the anus forms first and then the mouth, which makes it look like a deuterostome. In addition to this, they also have uh, enterocelous formation of body cavities, which coincides with uh, deuterostome characteristics. However, molecular evidence places this group close to the protostomes, um, along with a couple of other factors, such as they have a form of spiral cleavage, but it's highly modified um, to the point where it doesn't even look like spiral cleavage, it looks like radial cleavage. And so, currently, I think the best place for these guys is over with the protostomes. Um, However, I don't think that they fit into the subclades of Ectysozoa or Spiralia. Um, obviously, they don't undergo ectysis, which is why they wouldn't be placed with the Ectysozoans, and they don't exhibit true spiral cleavage, which is why I wouldn't place them with Spiralia. Again, this is highly contested, but it seems like it belongs with the protostome branch of the phylogenetic tree, just probably as an outlier, as seen in this diagram. So I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the body systems. So obviously they don't have an excretory or a respiratory system. And so all of that nitrogenous waste and all of that gas exchange is going to be going through the body wall, which works just fine for them because they're very small. They have a high surface area to volume ratio, uh, which means that all of those different uh, nitrogenous wastes can be excreted from any part of the body and that every single tissue is still going to get oxygen and other important materials. They do have a central nervous system. It is centralized, so they have a cerebral ganglia and ganglia that go down the body. Um, in addition to this, they have eyes. However, these eyes do not have a lens, so they're not image forming. What's unique about their eyes, however, is that they're split into five parts, and each part is separated by an opaque pigment. And so what this allows them to do is determine the direction and intensity of light. They also have mechanoreceptors. They're hairs on the side of the body, which work similar to the lateral line, and they can detect the movement and the location of prey items. In addition to all of this, it's thought that they probably have chemoreception, however, there's been no hard evidence of chemoreception in this group. In terms of reproduction, they are all hermaphroditic. They do not self-fertilize, however. They are internal fertilizers, and they undergo direct development, so they don't see a larval stage. In terms of their movement, they have a series of fins, either two on the posterior side along with like a caudal fin, or one or some sort of combination. And they use these for movement as well as their longitudinal muscles. 
Um, however, they are still plankton, so they are still subjected to the currents. What's most unique about a chemonath is probably its head morphology. Um, chemonaths have these spines, which can all be manipulated individually, and that allows for a great maneuvering and manipulation of prey um, near the mouth. They can also be covered by a retractable hood when necessary. In addition to these spines, chemonaths also have teeth, they're very small and typically hollow. Um, they are venomous, and this has been found in multiple species across multiple genera. Um, the poison that they seem to, or the venom they seem to use is called TTX, which blocks sodium ion channels and causes paralysis in their prey. This was first observed in a laboratory setting when a scientist noted that the ketonath was trying to eat a copepod, and the copepod became immobilized. Further studies have been done on TTX, and it turns out that the ketonath does not make this alone. It appears that multiple species across multiple genera uh, house Vibrio aglinolyticus, which is a bacteria which will generate the TTX for the Hedonath to use. Um, it's unclear what quantities of V. alginolyticus is in the Hedonath, um, and specifically where it's located in the head, but we do know that it can produce significant amounts of TTX to assist the Hedonath in its prey capture. Um, just a couple more notes about feeding. They are nocturnal feeders. Um, and they feed typically on small crustaceans, such as cocoa pods. Um, they also feed on larval fish stages. And if there's no food that's really present, they will resort to feeding on other ketonaths. But this has been studied and it seems to be a last resort kind of situation. So where are they found? They're found pretty much everywhere you can think of that's marine or estuarine. Um, they can be found in the Southern Ocean up to the Northern Atlantic and every sea in between. Um, they do mostly hang out as planktonic animals, although some of the species are benthic. Um, and so they've been studied, I know, over here in the Humboldt Court Current They've also been studied in the Caribbean, really heavily in the Southern Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, in the Black Sea, um, and multiple other locations. So they are very widespread. So why should we care about learning about this species or even care what it does? Um, well, it's super important. Um, in terms of biomass in the marine environment, they are second to copepods in abundance. Um, so they're clearly a very integral part of the food web, and thus we need to understand their movements and their uh, preferred habitats. So for example, in one study they determined that ketonaths don't necessarily like low oxygen levels. And so depending on the season and the area where you find the ketonaths, they might move out of that area if low oxygen becomes an issue. And so we have to look at that and say, well, does it create a, a trophic cascade? Does this affect fish movement? Does it, this affect other predator movement up the food chain? And so it's really important to understand how they work in order to understand how our entire marine ecosystem works. So obviously more studies need to be done and more research needs to be done, but this is a very important group for the marine environment.